please turn to Luke chapter 2. And we'll be looking at verses 8 through 20 this morning, being Christmas Eve. Normally we're in uh, the book of 1 John, if you've been with us and tracking with us, and this being Christmas Eve, the Sunday before Christmas, um, I thought it would be good to do a Christmas message, right? Because we love Christmas. Um, just a word about tonight, the, the, you know, I kind of breezed through the, the, the Christmas Eve service. I do want to encourage you to come. You know, the last Sunday of the month is the Sunday we take communion and we save communion not for the morning service but for tonight. So if you're, if you're uh, available and, and can come, uh, please come and share us with a time of worship and we'll have communion this evening. Uh, it'll be wonderful. This morning we're looking at, um, and oh, by the way, I'll be talking tonight about, and I get excited about all this, this, this Bible stuff. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, uh, you know, just talking about the names of Jesus. And it won't, it won't be a long message, and by that I mean, uh, it, um, I don't know what I mean by that. It won't be as long as normal, maybe. Uh, but just the names of Jesus, you know, the fact that he is, right? Even at his birth, he is, because he always was. And Isaiah says these wonderful things, right? He's a wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, everlasting father, and that's who he is. You know, even at his birth, he, he maintains that. And so I, we'll be sharing about that tonight. I'm really excited about it. Um, but this morning, I'm excited as well about the simple message of Christmas. This is taken from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. And I, I, I don't know about you, but uh, usually the Christmas season, it kind of comes on us quite quickly. Maybe, maybe you kind of you gradually grow into it or not. I kind of had this moment this year where it was like, oh, wow. It's Christmas, and that was like you know, three days ago. We had that moment of like, wow, it's Christmas. And it's kind of the, the busy season, right? And it's easy to kind of lose sight of some things that happen in the Christmas season. And as believers, we know that it's about Christ. It's about his birth, and we, we know that. But yet the season and our schedules and all these things demand, right? They just demand your time, and, and you get caught up in it. And the next thing you know, you, you, you kind of forget about the simplicity, the wonderful simplicity about this fact that this Savior has come. For God so loved the world, right? He's come. And, you know, it's just it's a lot of times we just overlook that. We'll go through stresses of life. We'll go through the cares of life. And we'll get consumed. I don't know. I don't want to have anyone raise your hands. But sometimes we just kind of get all tied up in knots, if you will. And then there's this moment where we're like, oh, you know what? There is a king. And God has a simple answer. It reminds me of a story of a, of a gentleman who, who had this this issue going on. He had always had this constant ringing in his ears and his, his eyes were bulging and he had a flushed face and he, di- he didn't know what was causing it. So he, he went to doctor after doctor and there was no hope for him and he just continually had this ringing in his ears. His eyes were bulging and his face was flushed. So finally he found a doctor that said, you know what, I think I know what your problem is. It's your tonsils. Let's take your tonsils out. So he says, okay, let's, let's get it done. The tonsils come out, he heals up, and to, to his amazement, he still has the same problem. Or I should say to his discouragement, he has the same problem. Ears, he's, he's got ringing in his ears, eyes are bulging, and his face is flushed. And he goes to another doctor, and the doctor says, you know, I think maybe we should take your appendix out. That's, that's what's going on here, and of course he has it done. And then that doesn't help at all. And he goes to another doctor who says, uh, maybe it's your teeth. Let's go ahead and pull all your teeth out feeling very frustrated, not quite sure about that. He's, he's sick and tired of the ringing in his ears and his eyes bulging out. And say, I look kind of funny half the time. You know, you know what? Let's pull them out. Pull the teeth out. To which there is no avail. There's no, no hope. No help, right? So he finally goes to the next doctor, and the doctor says, you know what? I, I don't know what, what we can do for you. I think you only have six months to live. So feeling distraught, he, he quits his job. He takes his, some money out of the checking account, and he says, you know what, I'm going to live the last six months I have. I'm going to live them in style. He goes down to his tailor and wants to get brand new suits. He wants to look really good. So the tailor's measuring his arms, and he says, God, it's 34, 35 length, and measures his neck, and he says, 16, and the man says, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's 15 around my neck. And Taylor says, well, let me, let me remeasure that, right? So he remeasures around his neck, and he goes, nope, it's, uh, it's 16. And the man says, well, I've always been a 15. I've always worn a 15. I want to look good. It's my last six months is what's happening. I want to look sharp. Please do it right. And in the, which the tailor responds and says, well, that's okay. I will do it. I will make it a 15, but don't blame me. You have ringing in your ears. Your 
eyes start bulging out, <laughs> and you have a flushed face. <laughs> you were listening. That's good. <clears throat> Some of you are thinking you strung that out way too long. But. <laughs> Some of the simplest answers, right? Yeah, Brian, thank you. Yeah. Some of the simplest answers in life are usually right in front of us, right? Changing of the shirt, changing of the neck, and all these issues go away. And, and it's like that in our world. We turn on the, the, the television, we watch the news, and it doesn't sit for me, it doesn't take long, right? 20 seconds, and you're like, man, Lord, come now, please. There's, a pro- there's problems. You know, maybe you know of a, of a loved one or a friend or a family member just going through difficulty, and, and you want to help them. And, and maybe the, the, the issue is a little bit complex, and maybe there's some discouragement, right? Just, just listen to this, or, or, you know, I want to help you, and it doesn't seem like anything works. And maybe you've had those moments, and maybe life right now just kind of feels that way. And yet God says, you know what, here's, here's the solution to your sin problem. I'm going to send this baby. Right? And that just sounds kind of a little t- too simple, too good to be true. Right? Here's, I'm going to send this baby. Here it is, it's God's provision. I, I love this world so much, I'm going to send my son into it. He's not going to come as this conquering warrior. He's not going to come you know, as some type of giant man and, and full of muscles and all this kind of stuff. He's going to come as a baby. It's going to come vulnerable, right? So we can think of it that way. And you might have, you think about these things, and maybe you've, sh- you've kind of shared the truth of what Christmas is to those you know, and maybe those who don't believe, and they kind of think it's just a little, a little too simple, right? God's solution is a little too simple for us. We're sophisticated people. We're smart. I know my shirts are 15s, not 16s. You know, we know. We've got, I've got it. And I think the Lord's you know, his reminder to us, and I think this Christmas season, is not, you know, not allowing it to get out of hand. I know there's busy and busyness and all that, but there's this wonderful, simplistic truth of the gospel message found right, right at the beginning of the birth of Jesus. And Luke has this for us. <clears throat> Luke, beginning in, in, uh, in verse 8 uh, through 20 in chapter 2, and he says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out, in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the Lord, or excuse me, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angel had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. Let me offer a brief prayer this morning. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the fact that Christ has come. Lord, thank you that your truth is for all people. Lord, we take such great hope and encouragement from that, knowing your truth is for us, that we this morning are not here by accident, but on purpose, that you have truth for us. So Lord, I ask that you'd allow me to get out of the way, that all our eyes and our lives would be fixed upon you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we have this this wonderful story, the Christmas story, the simplistic message, right? Jesus has come. God is going to deal with our our sin problem by sending a baby, right? The the son. And he comes and he shares this this wonderful truth. God pronounces it 
right, to the shepherds. And, and that's kind of this, my first point I want to look at this morning, just some truths from this, is that this message is for all people. It may seem like it's complex, but this simple truth, this message is for all people. Luke says in, in verse 8, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch by their flock, at night, if you notice that this text doesn't say that there were the right people or the sophisticated people or the, the religious leaders of the day out in the field, you know, of all the people God could pronounce this truth to, who does he come to? Some shepherds. Here is Jesus coming to the earth. Here is this, this supernatural, wonderful moment where God is stepping into our world and he takes a moment. This is kind of like God's character, right? He comes to those who are the lowliest, if you will, right? He comes to these shepherds. And he says, look, here is the pronouncement. I want these shepherds to go and see what is going on in Bethlehem. So my question this morning as we look at this message, you know, that it's for all people. It begins with these shepherds. And, and we have to wonder, why, why shepherds, right? Why would God choose shepherds. I mean, most likely these shepherds, if, if this was their career, I think it's, it's kind of known that they were typically ceremonially unclean. They were treated that way. I think in the Jewish law, they, they said not to trust them as witnesses. A shepherd could not be trusted as a witness, which is ironic because they are going and being witnesses, and they're going to go witness. You know, that's, that's amazing to me, but it's kind of like you know, man's way and God's way. It's coming to a clash here. Shepherds usually weren't schooled. They were most likely uneducated to some extent. Um, but that's kind of the background. And Jesus is, is brought to this world, and the announcement comes to these shepherds. And so what do we learn from that? What is, what is God communicating in this idea that this truth is for all people? And the first thing I think under the first point is this message is simple to understand. Right? God doesn't, doesn't put his truth on the, on the top shelf, if you will. He, he kind of says, you know what, it's for everyone. Wherever you are at in life, whatever you're going through, we can understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't require a theological education. Now, everyone who, who knows, I think everybody honestly has a theology. We have some type of understanding of God, whether, whether it's the right one or not, whether it's from Scripture or not. Right? But even as believers, we are growing in our theology, our understanding of who God is. And so, in one sense, we do have a, a theological uh, understanding to some extent, but that's not what I'm getting at, this idea that you have to be a sophisticated intellectual. Right? The truth doesn't come to just intellectuals. It does, right? They tend to struggle with it more than others, I think, because they overthink it or, or struggle with the simplicity. But if, there, if it was this, just this way, I mean, think about it for a moment. If you had to be... Uh, somebody of stature, of, of understanding. Well, isn't there a, a, a place in our lives where we could look at those who don't have that and say, you know, you don't have it, I do. And it becomes a sense of pride and pat myself on the back. But this isn't how God operates, right? His truth is for all of us. So it doesn't require that, though we should grow in that, right, as far as a theological understanding. But it doesn't require this. The good news about Christ you know, first announced by the shepherds is the idea that it is simple to understand. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 through 31, where he says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But to him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord." So we see this, this idea of God coming to shepherds, that this message is for everyone, regardless of where we're at, what we're going through life. There's not a place for us to say, I've arrived in a sense, and, and because I'm so smart, the gospel has, has, has you know, come to me and I've got it. That's not how the Lord operates. And right out of the gate, right, right at the birth of Jesus, he is communicating that this truth, right, and he says it right in Scripture, is for all people. 
And that's wonderful, right? The simplicity of the gospel. Doesn't that encourage you to go on and keep sharing the gospel, right? To those who, who we may think they'll never come, but it is. It is for everyone, whether they believe or not. I love it. As Charles Spurgeon, big fan of, of, uh, of Spurgeon, and, and Spurgeon was quoting this quote from Luther, which I'm another big fan of Luther, and he goes on, it says, Luther called John 3.16 the heart of the Bible, the gospel in miniature. It's so simple a child can understand it, yet it condenses and goes deep the marvelous truths and reveals to us the redemption in a few poignant words. And he, and he goes to John 3.16, which says, God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world, the greatest number, that he gave the greatest act, his only begotten son, the greatest gift, that whoever, the greatest invitation, believes the greatest simplicity in him, the greatest person, should not perish the greatest deliverance, but the greatest difference have the greatest certainty, everlasting life, the greatest possession. Right at the birth. I thought that was wonderful. If you want a copy of that, I'll give that to you later. But it's very good. They're very simple, right? The idea that this is for everyone. Now, the wonderful thing about the gospel, and you know this, for those of us who have been walking with the Lord for a long time, is the depth seems like it continues to get deeper. There's more we can learn and more we can search out. But the very truths, the, the life-changing truths are for all people. So we see God coming to these shepherds and sharing with them. And the idea is that it is, it is for everyone. It is a truth for everyone. And the second thing I think we learn about this is that this message also brings, of course, reconciliation. Reconciliation. The idea that, that God is coming and he's communicating to these shepherds. And we say, well, Lord, why is it coming to shepherds? Of all the people on the earth, of all those of noble and of stature, why is it being pronounced and shared with, proclaimed rather, to these shepherds? Well, there's this message of reconciliation. And we see this kind of very symbolically. right? The idea of shepherds. Here you have shepherds who are out in the field tending sheep. right? And, and in the culture and the Jewish culture and the sacrificial way, these sheep most likely, a lot of them would be used in a sacrificial, right, for the sacrifice, excuse me, the sacrifice of sins. The Bible teaches in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, right? But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we understand that sin eternally separates us from God. John talks about the idea of sin is lawlessness, right? It's not the 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 very keeping track or keeping score and saying, well, we keep this and don't keep that. No, John just kind of backs up from that argument. and He says the, the, the idea of sin is lawlessness. It is the willful rebellion behind all of it, right? We have this rebellion problem. We are the ones who stand against God. We are the ones who are aliens once, right? We stood against Christ. And, and John says there's only two groups of people, right? Things we've been going through in 1 John. There are those who follow after Christ, Right? Those of, of Abel, if you will, and those of Cain who, who are of the, of the devil. And you have got these two groups. There's no gray area. And so we have this sin problem. And we've broken our first fathers, broken the covenant. Right? Adam disobeyed. And sin has come. And God deals with our sin problem. He brings a message of reconciliation. That is great news. That is the good news because he loves you. And he uses shepherds. This very wonderful symbolic picture that we have. So we see that the message is simple to understand. He, it's a message of reconciliation. The last thing I think why he brings is a message for us to shepherd others. I think there's this wonderful kind of picture of God's doing this. And you, you think about, you know, in one sense we see shepherds as kind of the lowliest of society, but then we see out of the Bible such wonderful figures who were shepherds. Right? We know David as a shepherd boy. And there's, there's this element where he's very dear to God's heart. Yeah, and the metaphor of, of, of course, shepherding and sheep is, is played out in the good shepherd. Jesus becomes the good shepherd, the one who watches over you, right? The one who cares for you, the one that knows you, the one that protects you, the one that has and will lay down his life for you. 
This is who he is. And I believe as we know him, there is this wonderful calling that comes from this, is that God is challenging you also to aid and help and walk with others. God has called you to know him and know his son and, and enjoy salvation. Then he wants you to shepherd and be active in using your gifts to bless others. Now, you may or may not be called to be a pastor. Um, that may, that's why I always say may or may not. Don't ever write that off, right? <clears throat> but there are areas in the church in which you can serve and give. Right? One of the things that we want to see happen in, in our church, and I'm going to plug it right here, is our life groups. Right? Dr. Bob's and mine happen on Sunday morning, and I know when I mention this other one, they're going to start clapping. But there's one that meets on Thursday night, Frank Tyler's life group. <laughs> Let's pray again. No. <laughs> you know, there's this, this idea. And there's, there's things on Sunday morning where, where we have just this, you know, this 50 minutes, so to speak, in which to talk about truth and share our lives. But midweek where it's expanded, right? Where you have these moments where you can come and you can share your life and give accountability and also receive accountability and, and, and be a part of, of, of that truth. You know, opening your home and, and maybe facilitating discussion and Bible study in your house, is that something the Lord is leading you? Is that something you need to come and talk to me about? We want to see that expanded. And here we have this picture, right? God just didn't, he didn't save you to come and sit on a pew, right? He saved you to come to action. There are gifts and talents and abilities in you that God desires to bring out of you. God desires to glorify his son in you and how you live. Right? It begins with who you are, begins with your family, but it also works itself out in the context of church, right? Other, follow, uh, other fellow believers. So I set that challenge before you. And of course, there's other areas, children's ministry and Awana ministry and, and youth, right? We have some youth here this morning. They're not nearly as excited as, the, as, as Frank's life group. Guys, come on. <laughs> There's other areas in which to get involved. Why does, why does God do this? He has this desire that we would come. And you see this in the shepherds, and we'll talk about this here in a moment. They go to action, right? Announcement has come. Change has come to their lives, and they go do something about it. So we see at the beginning of this that this message is simple, but it's for all people. It's for each and every one of us. And, and of course, this next point kind of flows right into this idea of shepherds. What I'm calling the message is simple in its content. I've been talking about this for a little bit. This is verses 9 through 14. Look what he says. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. Here they are. They're shepherding, right? They're doing their work out in the field. An angel arrives. It's had to be a moment of, of taking two steps back and going, who is this? What is happening? Right? I'm sure that's going through their minds. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. All right? Something is happening. And they were, of course, greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, right, as this is pronounced, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, goodwill toward men. So we have this idea that it is simple in its content. It's, it's all inspiring, this truth, right? This very simple proclamation. The angels are praising God and singing out, Here he has come. The Savior has come. He's come for you. Right? For me, that's a wonderful truth to just let that roll around in your mind. He has come. You are not an accident. There is a purpose and a reason in which God has sent his son into this world. It is all inspiring. God has brought salvation. The Messiah has come in the most humble of circumstances. He could have come, like I said earlier, like a, a warrior or a man. I always think of Simeon waiting, right? Waiting on, on the Messiah, that God had promised him that he would see the Messiah before his death. And I always thought about, what it, you know, how did he know? He's sitting in the temple waiting for the Messiah. Does he show up like a grown man? Does he show up? You know, he doesn't know, but he trusts that the Lord will reveal it. And of course, when Mary and Joseph come he sees the baby, he knows right away, this, this is the Messiah. So he could have come a lot of different ways, but he comes this way. In the humble beginnings, 
And I think about the angels, their response, or excuse me, the shepherds, their response to this. You think of our society and the simple of truths today offend everybody. I don't know if you've kind of picked up on that trend, right? That everything offends everybody. And I can imagine these shepherds kind of being, well, this angel came out of nowhere. It wasn't announced. I mean, who knows, right? That offends me. I, I, can, I don't think they're doing that. But you, you kind of think about that because we see this over and over in our society. And you wonder how they kind of, kind of work through that. But they weren't, right? They see this. They're afraid, of course. Something out of this world is happening. It's happening in their midst. And they say, this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swelling clothes, lying in a manger. You know, that's very amazing uh, uh, directions, if you will, right? Here's, here's what I want you to go to, because this is what they go do. You know, and it, it's like, I don't know if this is your mind, you think this way, but I think this way, right? They could have said, I, maybe they did. Here's where you need to go. They tell them a location, but they don't say a house or, or like, you know, it's on the corner of Walnut and, and Demery, right? It's, it's nothing like that, or like in Oklahoma, where it's like, you know, 76 Court North, East, this, and I've never been to Oklahoma. I still can't work out there struggle with it right and i need road maps so i like the idea of bethlehem but give me the sign like is it next is the house next to a big rock right you know, get, none of that is here right of course they know they're led right of course but i just think of this and going this sounds pretty crazy i don't know if you know if you, you you see this and of course it's amazing i'm afraid the angel is we all this and what do we do now right this wonderful proclamation has happened and of course they go and what do they find yeah, we found the baby, right? We found a carpenter. We found his, his young wife here. We found this baby wrapped in swollen clothes. And, and here they are. Here it is. So humble, right? So simple in its content. The angel tells him, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, Christ the Lord. He pronounces this prophecy. Micah talked about this 700 years before. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem in the city of David. Here he is. These shepherds are the first guys on the scene, right? They get to go see it. The angels communicate this simple truth. A Savior, Christ the Lord, not a judge, a deliverer. Came to save, not destroy. You know, it's interesting. They, the, the angels say the Lord, right? They acknowledge it. This baby is the Lord. This, this whole unfolding, swallowing clothes, all this stuff, he, he's the Lord. You know, later on in Luke chapter 2, in this, in this same chapter, verses 23, they use Lord again, the law of the Lord. They talk about the, the, the holy, or excuse me, and holy to the Lord. And I'm sure if, if Luke changed the meaning, he would have let us know, right? But the meaning is consistent in the context. They're clearly talking about God. The angels are already yielding to him, the Lord. They're acknowledging who he is. Nothing could be more simple and yet more profound. Here it is. The Savior has come this way. And it has to be this way. I know in Romans chapter 3, Paul says that he might, right? God might be the just and justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. The Savior had to come. And we have this idea that the message is simple. Children can understand the simplicity of the gospel and yet theologians cannot fathom its depths. It's wonderful. Right? The message is for all people, for you and I, for those we come in contact with. The content is simple, right? Here, here it is. Savior has come this way. It's not a truth maybe you and I would set up, but this is how God went about it. And my last point this morning is the message is simple in its obligations. Verses 15 through 20. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, right? This is that moment. You know, did you see what I saw? No, did you see it? Yes, we all saw it, right? Let's have a conversation where they say, Let's, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all, all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard 
and seen and was told them. So how do they respond to the obligations, right? The angel comes on the scene and says, here it is. The Messiah has come, the Lord, a Savior is being born, right, in Bethlehem. He's over there. He's right over there. Go check it out, right? And this is what you're going to find. You're going to find a carpenter there. You're going to find this, this, uh, the mother of Jesus, Mary. She's, she's there, and you're going to find this baby wrapped in swollen clothes, and there it is. And they have this converse, right? They converse with themselves. What should we do about this? Let's, let's go check it out. Of course, right? You're going to go check this out. So they go, and what did the shepherds do? So I, their response to this is, first and foremost, they believed. There's, I mean, I can imagine them doubting. You know, maybe they, they, they think about, oh, something I ate last night, and all of a sudden this light comes. I mean, I don't know, right? None of that is here. They see it, and they know there is a, a wonderful truth and conviction about what this is. Maybe there's an anticipation. They believe, and their belief is shown in their obedience to what the angels told them. And they go. They go and check it out, and they see for themselves, and they tell. They make widely known. This is what they do. Let's tell others about this. And then they go back. Let's go back. We go find our sheep. Some of them, I'm sure, straight off. But they're changed. They go back glorifying and praising God. So what, what is the obligation? What are the simple obligations for you and I this morning that we see in this passage? The first one is just simply how the shepherds responded. We must believe that Christ is the Lord. We have to believe that He is the Lord. We see that throughout Scripture. Receive the message by faith and respond in obedience. Shepherds could have said, man, that's, that's a crazy sign. This is, you know, let's sit around the campfire and talk about this for a while. Let's go get some religious leaders and, and kind of maybe process this with them and talk about it, right? None of that is there. Of course they go. They believe. The shepherds heard the angel. They left their flocks. They went straight to Bethlehem, and their lives were never the same. I believe when God reveals Christ to us, when we come to know Him, when the Spirit opens our eyes, and we see, right, we see that contrast of a holy and just God and the, and the sin that separates us, we realize that there is no way. There's a, there's a holy fear that comes upon us, and we might feel that dread, and then we know there is a Savior. That Savior is Christ, and because of Him, and Him alone, believing and trusting on Him, I can be saved from my sins. I can have reconciliation with God because of Christ. That changes us. It should change us. If you this morning have believed on Christ, then your life will not be the same. You might have bumpy roads. I know there's difficulties. I know sometimes it feels like we walk through valleys. Read the Psalms. I mean, David writes about those things over and over again. But there's always a resolve. There's always a crescendo that gets to the place that says, you know what? God is a mighty God. I know he's got a purpose and a plan even in this. I look at the cross. I see his love for me. He may not feel very close, but I know in whom I have believed. I believe in this. I believe in Christ. There will be a change. And it's important to note here that we're not talking about you know, living this out in, in, in a sense of earning our justification. That is a work done by God. God opens our eyes. But our living out of our sanctification, right? Living out this truth like there is change in us. Paul says in Ephesians 2, he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. God prepared beforehand, and we should walk in them. Of course we're going to live this out. God has the purpose, a calling, and meaning. He's things in front of you to do. He's equipped you with gifts in which to operate in that way. So we, we, want, we see the simple obligations is first and foremost, believe, right? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing is we must tell others the good news. All right, what did they go and do? They reported it to others, 2.17. Uh, now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them. Here, it's amazing to me, these shepherds, isn't there a wonderful empowerment that happens? The disciples, right, before Jesus goes to the cross, they're, they're kind of disraised, and he goes and dies, and they're like, I'm not home, what are we going to do? Then they realize and believe he has risen again, that everything he said is true, and what happens, there is a change. 
This is how they, they, get, they get whipped and say, do you want to stop preaching in the name of Jesus? And they, they get whipped for it and they go out rejoicing. How do we get there? I, found, I was found worthy to suffer for his name because there's a change. There's this understanding that there is a holy and a just God and I do not belong in his presence. There's nothing in me that would ever earn that or be good enough except for my Savior. And guess what? God provided that for me too. So they make it widely known. They came with haste. They found Mary and Joseph, the babe, in the manger. I'm I'm assuming that this night, we always sing about it, silent night, right? We sing about it earlier. I I wonder if this wasn't quite so silent of a night, right? You got these shepherds on the scene going around, look, this is what happened. I mean, you imagine all of them had to share their story. And and, And he was standing there, and I was here, and this was happening. There was a light. Did you tell them about the light? You can imagine all that happening. And there's a baby, you know what, we'd like to have him go to sleep. He's been crying, and, and they're telling you, imagine that this is all happening. There's excitement. I think there's a joy, right? Isn't there a joy that should happen in the Christian's life? Isn't there a reason for it? And joy sometimes is, is marked with tears, but there's a constant. There's a Savior. Imagine if the shepherds took their eyes off of this truth, right, and begin to focus back on themselves, and they started to reason within themselves and thinking about, well, you know what? We're, no one will believe us. We're just shepherds. No one's going to believe that. I mean, we can't even be trusted. We can't even be called upon to be a witness in a crime, right? I mean, no one's going to call on us. And I think oftentimes, you know, we may think that way. The, 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 you know what? Someone else with the right gifts can, can share that truth a little bit better or or maybe, you know, someone else will do this. Or, uh, you know what, I fell before. I'm sure I'll fell again. And that very well may be the case. But is that reason to stop? No, we should keep going. And the point that we have to understand is not everyone is going to respond positively to the gospel. Right? We trust the Spirit. But God has called you, has equipped you to keep moving forward. If we believe this truth concerning the Savior, then how can we be silent? We live it out. We tell about it. We should believe in it. And lastly, we see here, I see the angels, or excuse me, the shepherds glorifying, of course, the angels as well, right? Glorifying God and praising, right? Verse 20, then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen or heard and seen as it was told them. Here we have this, this moment, you know, in the beginning of this, the angels come on the scene and they're the ones praising and glorifying God and now the shepherds have taken their place they've gone to Bethlehem they've now returned they are the ones praising and glorifying God salvation has come these things are are happening right and they go back to the to the same context of their lives they go back to their sheep but yet they are now forever changed You think about it, I don't know if you've put some thoughts to this, but there's this pause, right? Between, we have this intertestamental pause. We have, you know, God not speaking through his prophets, and then we don't have anything until the birth of Jesus. And, and yet you have the birth of Jesus, and then there's like this 30-year pause before Jesus comes on the scene. He begins his earthly ministry with these words that are taken from Matthew. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or Mark, when Jesus says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. And believe the good news, believe the gospel. You think about why didn't God just take these these shepherds who were eager to communicate this truth and just continue to go forward, right? The simple truth. And yet, of course, it wasn't the time. It was for Christ's earthly ministry. They just simply returned to, to their work. They returned to their lives. But now they're changed. They're worshiping God. They're glorifying God for what they've seen. And I think the gospel is as simple as as Jesus communicates. The depths are unsearchable, but yet the truth of repent and believe changes lives. And I think today, you know, maybe we as Americans, definitely the church in America is, is quite consumed with the big, right? The 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 production, the the spectacular, if you will. There might be the right motive about changing lives and seeing lives come into the kingdom, and those things have their place. 
But I think sometimes, we, even in that, we lose sight of the simplicity of repent and believe the gospel. And when that happens, right, a life is changed and the angels worship and sing because God has done something wonderful. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, he says, But I fear, at least somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in Christ. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this quote, Whatever is Christian is always essentially simple. Simplicity is not incompatible with depth. The truth is very simple. God is calling us to live <clears throat> excuse me, as simple people. <clears throat> to glorify His Son, to praise Him in the context of our lives. And that's what we see these shepherds doing. The truth of the gospel is unsearchable. The depths seem like they never end. They just go on, the depths of God. But yet we shouldn't lose sight of the simplicity of what is happening. This wonderful Savior has come. Reminds me of a story of some kids who were putting on a Christmas play and to show the radiance of the manger, they had set this scene up where all the lights would be turned off and a light on the manger would, would come on to show that the, the light of God had come. People <clears throat> were all in their places and the, the show was going on and at the right scene, the kid controlling the lights had panicked and he shut all the lights off awkward silence and finally one of the shepherds in a quiet whisper a stage whisper said hey you switched off Jesus right? I think sometimes in, in life in the middle of, of busyness in the middle of, of Christmas we switch off Jesus and there's this wonderful simple truth that just should resonate in the depths of our heart Christ has come he is calm, and at his birth, he was a savior. And God's love for you is demonstrated in the simplicity of this wonderful message.